Good afternoon. I am Andrea Chisholm with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Senior managers and the board of the JUTC bus company are locked in a meeting to discuss the findings of the Auditor General's report. The meeting was scheduled to start at 8 o'clock. In a release, the JUTC board said it takes the findings seriously as the company is a public body subject to government regulations. The board says the JUTC will urgently make policy changes to correct the breaches. Meanwhile, opposition spokesman on transport, Mikhail Phillips, says the JUTC performance audit has confirmed the shortcomings over the years. The report, which was tabled in Parliament in, on Tuesday, pointed to several weaknesses in accountability standards for the bus company. The report also stated that breaches identified by the risk manager and recommendations of the internal auditor were either ignored or not adequately addressed. Mr. Phillips says many of the problems have been in the public domain for a long time. We have been speaking about some of what we have seen in the report, um, concerns dealing with parts, dealing with the rolling stock, um, dealing with employment. It was Minister Mike Henry, when he was Minister of Transport, who spoke about the JUTC being overstaffed and that he was going to do an in-depth um, analysis of the employment there. We haven't seen the light of day of that report um, and persons are still being employed at the same levels uh, up to three years ago when he made that statement. Mr. Phillips responded to criticism that some of the breaches occurred while the opposition PNP was in office. In, a, in the last administration, PNP administration, we knew that there were challenges. Um, the Minister of Transport, Omar Davis, uh, had a policy of renewing the rolling stock over a five-year period. The last time buses were, new buses were added to the fleet was at the end of the last PMP administration. None has been added since then. Um, we knew that we, we saw an uptick in the, in the fear box then, but at least you saw policy in moving forward, and it would not happen overnight of repairing the breaches that were at the JUTC. Uh, it was not perfect, but what we are seeing now is that there has been no policy at all. In the meantime, an explanation this afternoon for why some commuters have been experiencing frustrating waits for JUTC buses. Dwayne Anderson picks up that story. The Auditor General's report explained that even on routes where the JUTC made a lot of money, it still failed to put enough buses to meet the demand. The JUTC leadership blamed absent drivers for some of the delays on its routes. But the Auditor General in her checks said that explanation was not what the JUTC's own records showed because the JUTC in fact had too many drivers. Now a more likely explanation for the delays on some JUTC routes is the mechanical condition of the buses. A lot of them would break down quite frequently on the roads. One reason for this is because the JUTC management failed to service the units often enough. Between 2016 and 2019, the number of unplanned work or road calls increased between 49 and 80 percent. And speaking of maintenance, the AG also found that the JUTC used a lot of outside mechanics to work on its buses. This despite what the AG found was an excess of mechanics on the JUTC's staff. Over $400 million was used by the JUTC to pay non-JUTC mechanics to carry out mechanical work on its buses, which included even basic servicing of the buses. The $400 million spend spiked from $26 million in 2014-2015. One local dealer in particular made close to $100 million for mechanical work done on an entire fleet of Golden Dragon buses. The spend is even more curious because the JUTC's own mechanics should have been able to fix the Golden Fleet buses thanks to a one-year technical training provision that came with buying these buses. Now another outstanding question from the AG's report concerned a software system called the Automated Vehicle Locator. As the name suggests, this piece of technology would help management locate where the buses were at any given time and help reduce idling or speeding by drivers. The system was acquired in 2017, but over two years later when this audit was done, the AVL was not yet mainstreamed. In fact, the project was still in its pilot stage. Just over $9 million was spent on the equipment needed to use on the vehicle locator system. 
The JUTC explained that the system would have been in place for the 2019-2020 financial year. Now, in light of the deficiencies, the Auditor General recommended that the Ministry of Transport develop a competency profile for the JUTC board because certain skills are needed to effectively run a bus company. The Ministry of Transport is also being advised to include an expert in logistics and financial analysis on the JUTC's board to improve its service and help with its financial risk management. Dwayne Anderson, TVJ News. The parliamentary opposition is seeking further clarity from the National Health Fund NHF and the link between a former board member whose company got millions of dollars in government contracts. Communication company Market Me has been under scrutiny for contracts with the health ministry to execute the Jamaica Moves program. News surfaced that one of its principals, Lindsay McDonnell, resigned from the board of the NHF in February 2017, one week before the NHF approved $15 million to pay for aspects of Jamaica Moves. In a statement, the NHF said it was aware of Ms. McDonnell's co-ownership of Market Me. Opposition spokesman on health, Dr. Maurice Guy, has concerns. It cannot be that on the appraisal panel for the first contract that one of the officers of the National Health Fund sat on that and then there is no um, and there is no escalation to management that we are dealing with a company owned by one of the directors of the National Health Fund then if this did not take place then certainly that officer ought to be sanctioned for such a move. Dr. Guy also wants to know if Ms. McDonough declared her interest in making an unsolicited proposal to the health ministry. He also wants to find out what point at what point did the NHF learn of the association between Market Me and Jamaica Moves. If they are not unaware of the association of one of their directors with Market Me Jamaica and by extension the contract to get the Jamaica Moves program approved for funding by them, then certainly if they had no difficulty in just assuming that particular position, then they have lost the confidence of the public in the arrangements and the governance structure of board management. And it's time for a break here on the Midday News, but stay with us. We have many more stories when we return. Welcome back and we're continuing the news. Parliament's Public Accounts Committee, PAC, is still seeking answers about the security detail that was assigned to former Education Minister Ruel Reed. Close protection personnel were reportedly assigned through the Caribbean Maritime University. PAC members queried the issue with Education Ministry officials at this week's meeting. There was a, a cadet, I think was the, the term, or a student, but who dressed in a white uniform that was appeared to be some sort of ADC or aide-de-camp of the minister that, that you know, accompanied him, mm -hmm. opened his door, gave him his his thing, oh, saluted him, um, saluted him, etc. Is that the is was that part of the security you made reference to part of this, or was that the protocol? I I, I can't speak to the genesis of the details, uh, Chairman, but a member. But I know there was the officer that was assigned. I know there was a great demand for my officer, the director of safety, to be providing services on a weekend and late evenings uh, for the minister, which was also now taking a toll on the activities of the unit. You mean and that he so, would, per the individual would personally provide that safety? Yes, is yes, and so that is why we had a discussion and approach our peers that we needed to put something more structured in place to support the minister since this seemed as if it was a need. But it's rather strange. I mean, it's, the CME was nothing to do with close protection services. I mean, CME was dealing with maritime matters and logistics, not 
protecting dignitaries in you know, personal security. So I, I just want, I don't understand if the minister needed more protection, close protection. There's a division, protective services division of the force that provides close protection services. He was already assigned one and he needed another apparently. Why would they not have been asked to provide this? Why would it have got, had anything to do with CMU at all? The Jamaica Constabulary Force JCF is again in mourning after they're mourning the loss of another member following a deadly motor vehicle collision in St. Elizabeth. Dead is 37-year-old Deputy Superintendent of Police Omar Morris of a St. Catherine address. It's reported that about 8.15 p.m. yesterday, DSP Morris, assigned to the Westmoreland Police Division, was driving his vehicle along the Charles Main Road in the parish when he tried to overtake another vehicle. He then collided with a white Toyota Hiace minibus after crashing into an embankment. His car then plunged into the Wyas River. We heard that the car going to the water, we, we, we going to the water, and we are going to the water, it's a dead man in the car, so we try to help him and take him out. We, we, then we go down there and, and, and to take out the man, he's a dead man, come out. So we try to tie the, the car with a rope, you know, go further into the water, so that in, in the next vehicle, when the next vehicle comes, can dry it out. DSP Morris was pronounced dead at hospital while the driver of the minibus was not injured. Fresh concerns this afternoon about whether the Jamaica Agricultural Society, JAS, can financially stand on its own anytime soon. The questions follow confirmation that the Denby Agricultural Show has been cancelled. More from Dwayne Anderson. From a loss of market to having to destroy entire crops and produce, the setbacks since COVID-19 have been huge for players in agriculture. But for some stakeholders, the cancellation of Denby 2020 is the biggest setback so far. The people of Denby and surrounding districts depend significantly on Denby. The largest plant sale in Jamaica each year is at Denby. So various nursery operators grow specifically for the sale that you would get. It is a place where new products are introduced, both from the cottage industry end and from the commercial side. Uh, agro input suppliers would demonstrate and launch new products. The Jamaica Agricultural Society, JAS, is also facing uncertainty as a result of the cancellation. The Denby Show is the group's largest earner. So the loss of revenue will really test the entity survival without the government's financial assistance. The JAS has been trying for some time to wean itself from the state. We are actively getting a consultant soon, according to MICAF, to help to write the exit plan for the JAS, which, despite the hardship that might come from it, I look forward to see the JAS back on its own as it was, prior to 1940, uh, and um, I don't think it's good to be, you know, have much to do with government with these institutions because it does impact your operation, how you behave, how you speak. This is the second time in nearly 70 years that the Denby Agricultural Show has been cancelled. The JAS President Lenworth Fulton is overlooking ahead. He believes the Denby Agricultural Show ground in Clarendon must be considered for large-scale events even amidst COVID. He said in terms of logistics, the Denby Show ground is perfect for physical distancing. The Denby itself is 52 acres of land. Maybe we'll have to open up more land. So there is a number of um, things that we might have to do. You can't shut down a country. You can't lock down physical events. You can't lock them down and say everybody must go virtual. It just can't work. So there must be a way in which uh, probably we'll in insist that everybody um, wears um, the mask and in our social area we will have to ensure that enough you know, space is there. But by next year I'm sincerely hoping that um, we'll back to normal operation. Dwayne Anderson, TVJ News.
The Jamaican Bar Association has weighed in on controversial statements made by an attorney which represented defendants in the fraud case involving the Manchester Municipal Corporation. The attorney pointed to misconduct in the office of the Director of Public Prosecutions. DPP Paula Llewellyn says the comment was loose, misleading and unfair. The Bar Association is reminding attorneys at law to abide by the ethics which govern the profession, especially to maintain the dignity of the courts and the integrity of the administration of justice. Thirty public sector workers will pursue graduate studies abroad following the official launch of the Marcus Garvey Public Sector Graduate Scholarship Program. It will run for the next five years and is expected to cost roughly $1 billion. The scholarships will be tenable at the University of the West Indies Mona and the University of Technology in Jamaica, as well as Johns Hopkins and Harvard Universities in the United States. In the United Kingdom, persons will be able to study at King's College London and Oxford University. The Scholarship Selection Committee will be chaired by the Governor-General. The scholarship initiative was first announced by Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark in his budget presentation. And in sports, West Indies legend Sir Everton Weeks was laid to rest a short while ago at a funeral held at Kensington Oval in Barbados. Weeks was buried alongside greats Clyde Walcott and Frank, Frank Worrell on the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. Weeks, who made his debut for the West Indies in January 1948 and played 59 tests in an illustrious career, died on July 1, 2020. Weeks was 95 when he died. He had been ailing for some time after suffering a heart attack in early 2019. And that's it for the Midday News. I'm Andrea Chisholm. Do remember to join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports and production teams, Good afternoon.